we'll be doing community stories. So once again, just um, the question, the prompt, how did you come to the Dhamma and what has it meant to you? Um, and if that's a bit too large of a question, you could also speak to what it's meant to you this last year. Um, we encourage people to not speak more than maybe four or five minutes at the most. And if you're unsure about sharing, just to really consider it a gift, it's, it's very meaningful for people to hear each other's stories. Uh, once again, um, if uh, you don't want to go up on YouTube afterwards, just tell us, we'll edit you out. And to uh, encourage folks to uh, speak to those who've spoken after the fact um, and just sort of thank them for sharing. Those on Zoom can share as well. Just raise your electronic hand. And um, a constant problem is people's mics tend to be down here. Do we have someone in the front row who literally, your job is literally to go like this and remind the speaker, not with an actual mic, Matt, good, yes. So your job is to mime the mic thing, good. And then if they, okay, so I'll just leave the space open and uh, please feel free to come up and share. Is anyone willing to lend us a cushion? I'm cushion, thank you, Sid. Great, great. Okay, is this the right position of the mic? Closer, right here. Good, okay. Okay, this is my first time getting up here and sharing my story. <laughs> oh, um, so how I came to the Dhamma. Uh, about 25 years ago, I happened to pick up a book on Buddhism. I read literally one line about uh, Buddha nature. And I went, oh my God, um, I'm not awful and no one else is either. <laughs> it was uh, an awakening right there. Um, and so at, at that point, I started reading as much as I could about Buddhism. And, um, and then about a year later, I went to grad school for psychology. And I had a teacher who was like a life-changing teacher for me and he was a Buddhist. Uh, at that age, 25 years ago, I was in a lot of pain. I was definitely on a self-destructive path. Um, and he just saw me. He, I feel like he picked me up by the nape of my neck and pointed me in a whole new direction. Um, so he got me going to Sims uh, 25, 20 years ago. He uh, held us, uh, he taught a small group of us students how to meditate on his free time. It was remarkable. Um, and uh, he also got me going to Cloud Mountain. And so for the next 10 years, I went on retreats at Cloud Mountain like three times a year. And I was, you know, what, what was really noticeable when I first started meditating is that so much anger and rage, old, old anger and rage from childhood was just coming right up. I had kept it so neatly repressed <laughs> um, and it was just all coming up. So my teachers said, you've got to let this in. Um, and so I would go on retreat. I would sit with my anger and rage and, and watch it arise and pass. And I did that for a long time. Um, and it really did change. It really did dissipate and transform. Uh, but I, I, I was sitting with it for a long time. Um, anyway, uh, now, all these years later, I find myself here <laughs> in such a different place. Wow. Um, and I feel like now I've arrived at this place where my practice is so much about Sangha, uh, being a part of a community, a healthy community. Um, and that is just so beautiful. So uh, so what 
the Dhamma has meant to me. It's meant everything, absolutely everything. Um, it's been uh, just a, a path of healing and growing and uh, and now here uh, appreciation of of being with others. Um, so deeply grateful for all of you, Ajahn Nisabo. Um, it's, it's a huge part of my life. Thanks. So we do three sadhus and make them sparkly. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yes, you can do Anjali. Yeah, okay, good, good. And no need to do the clock thing unless they go over like 15 minutes or something. Yeah, good. Hello everybody, this is Sid. And uh, I wanted to share my story and I thought like it would be very unique, but basically whatever I wanted to say, Jessica already said everything. <laughs> so she just reminded me of the story that Buddha used to teach with like the lady, her son suddenly died and she thought she couldn't process that thing that her son died. But then eventually she finds out that everybody basically had to go through some death and whatnot. So yeah, basically the same thing that Jessica's story and I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of people have the same thing. So um, I was born as a Muslim. But then I started uh, looking into other spiritual things and just like Jessica, I had a very difficult time at some point of life and a uh, lot of uh, uh, pain from the past and everything. But uh, luckily, I stumbled on Buddhism on YouTube, Ajahn Brahm's talk, and then I just kept listening and then, and uh, yeah, it just became part of my life. And I'm very grateful to see all the wonderful brothers and sisters here. And uh, this is my first Sangha. And I'm very excited and um, I'm very happy. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu. I think we have Mary on Zoom. Hello, everybody. Hello, Ajahn. That that uh, seat looks pretty empty <laughs> and the cushion. Okay. I um I just realized I'm in my 28th year in the Dharma, and I cannot imagine my life without it. Um, I first heard the Dharma when I was 48, and I was immediately home. I had um studied uh I'm in mental health practice. And I had studied with a great teacher who I realized now um, in my grad school started me looking, breaking down the rigidity of my thought of concepts and the this is so into looking at life as a process, looking at things as always moving. And um, that was very different from my upbringing. I had been a seeker. I was brought up Presbyterian, but stopped that as soon as I left home. I tried Judaism, Reformed Judaism, um, and finally ended on, I was a Unitarian when I first heard Buddhism, the Dharma, and I went immediately to it. I knew I was home. Um, I had, my, my growth in the Dharma has been very organic. My first teacher, there was very little, uh, it was, his approach was you meditated, you let, you didn't try to focus your mind, you just let your mind go, and then afterwards you did sati, you did remembering of what was happening in there. And through that, I did learn a lot about uh, dependent arising, how my mind worked, and I was so taken by it that when he offered me to do teacher training, I did that because I knew being a, I was already teaching mental health. I knew that the way to learn something is to try and teach it. And so I threw myself full bore into studying the Dharma, listening to Dharma talks and, and, um, and teaching it. And then um, there came a time where it just wasn't, right. I realized something was 
missing here. The, it was great to know how the mind worked, but it just kept going the same way. It wasn't a self-correcting mechanism. And and that's about the time that Ajahn Nisabo came back from Thailand for the first time. And the first time that I was really exposed to uh, monastic teachings and training. And what I realized is that my mind really did need training. It really did need help to learn how to bring out the brighter qualities and and drop the harder ones. Um, and then, um, and and then, so that's been going on, um, ongoing. And I've so appreciated these last few years with the the direction and the guidance of the Ajans and the Sangha. Um, about 10 years ago, I had cancer. And it was at that time that the Dharma stopped being a distant thing and started being a friend. I just held hands with the Dharma wherever I went, whatever I faced, there was the Dharma. As a matter of fact, in the death contemplation, the one thing I could not give up was the Dharma. And I'm very happy about that. And now again, the Dharma comes to my aid. I'm facing a rather brutal surgery at the end of March or beginning of April. And it's going to take a lot. But um, I'm looking at it as a retreat, really. I'm calling it my pains retreat instead of rains. It's my pains. And the P stands for pain and perception. I'm really curious about perception right now because I find that so much of perception is based on memory. It's hard to have a clear perception. So perception, the A stands for attention. Where do I put my attention? And also a suba practice. I, I want to look at this, the body being just part of nature and breaking it down, the bone stones, bone stones. I is for intention my intention to investigate this. My curiosity is always really, has been strong throughout the Dharma. And um, so I think my curiosity will carry me a lot with this one. I want to investigate what's going on. The N stands for recognizing a part of nature and learning how to nurture myself. And the S is for the spaciousness of the spirit. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that, and, and it should be Sangha, too, actually, when I think about that. I'm going to add Sangha to that. Yes. Uh, so when I look at all of that, I feel really blessed to have such a, a foundation to explore life and to support me through life. Um, and this is a little bit of a side it's something I've wanted to mention for a while, so I'll take this opportunity unless I get a, which I can't see, so I'm nanya. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I'd uh, like to give a shout out to everybody who's struggling with that fifth precept, um, because I struggled with it for a long time. I'm a child of the 60s. Pot was part of my life for a long, long time when my surgery is going to be a spinal reconstruction. So I have a lot of pain in my back and I have used pot with good effect to handle the pain. But somewhere in the since Ajahn Nisabo came back, it just hasn't felt right. Keeping the precept felt really important. So for a long time I struggled with that, but I did send set the aspiration that I could keep the fifth precept. And gradually Without me doing much at all, kind of like I, uh, uh, Santusika said, just setting the intention, it gradually has gone. And I'm happy to say I'm keeping all of the precepts. And it is a great, great belief. So I don't know how to sum up a life in the Dharma is that it's not over, that it has been a guide, a compassion. Uh, the kindness of it is incredible. And I, I just want to thank you all for being part of my journey. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You can tell Mary's been tapping in by her use of acronyms, which is an Ajahn Kovilo. <laughs> um, 
And uh, Mary was one of my first teachers. And um, I remember recently she said that she feels like she stopped becoming a, stopped being a household with a practice and became a practice with a household. I thought that was quite good. <laughs> so maybe more people here in the room. Go for Axel. Oh, right. Okay. Um, hi, I'm I'm Axel. On? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, I have only recently found the Dharma um, in my life, and uh, I'm I've I've always apparently um, I found out more recently that I've always kind of had the principles within me, at least without realizing it. Um, like. Uh, I've actually done that um, meditation quite a bit in my life of um, focusing on death and focusing on whether or not I would just be okay if I passed out and died. Um, would I be okay with where I am in my life? Would I be okay with my relationships? Would I be okay with losing everything? <laughs> um but uh, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot more recently um, because my mother died about two and a half weeks ago. Um, like it's early enough that we don't even know exactly how she died yet. Um, and I, I wanted to come up here and ask some advice to everybody here and anybody who has experienced some of the same things or even just has any form of advice um, I, I, um, it's not like incredibly hard for me to bear because I wasn't super close with my mother, but I, um, I've been feeling her a lot lately, um, telling me stuff like, don't make the same mistakes I did and telling me like to look into my childhood and go over the things that I've been blocking out for a, a very very long time um, to the point where I have in like incredibly bad memory um, and I'm quite young to have the intensely bad memory that I do have. Um, and yeah, I was, I was very eager to come up here cause I just, I wanted any, any advice to like, I have a lot of issues with allowing love into my life. And even if, it is in my life. I have a lot of um, issues accepting it and accepting that people are interested in my existence for more than a lot of the uh, superficial stuff that my family tends to lean towards. Um, and yeah, I, I just I just really love some advice right now. Some um, guidance would be absolutely wonderful because I'm I'm quite I just I don't really know what to do with myself <laughs> right now. Um, but yeah, uh, my my experience within the Dharma has been extraordinarily healing. Um, especially lately, like I started coming to these Buddhist gatherings literally two weeks before my mom died. So it was perfect timing to just have a space that I feel everyone is so welcoming and kind and loving and everyone here has their own views and perspectives on everything. And it's just, I, I love it. I love the space. I love the people here. Um, I don't think I've ever felt more welcome in a space ever. <laughs> it's It's been um, very wonderful, very, um, I don't think I've had enough time to really feel how loving and purifying this environment actually is because I'm quite stuck right now, but it's not really my fault. Um, yeah, it's it's been, I can't even describe in words how um, wonderful it's been just being able to be in a community like this and allowing myself to feel the things that I feel because of this community and just everything 
everything. I, I have no idea how I would have responded to my mother's death if I wasn't here. I might not still be here, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I really cannot express in words how amazing it, it really has been. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Axel, do you want to open the space now for people to, to share thoughts or is it more just afterwards when people want to talk to you, they can? Any time works for me. I mean, if nobody else wants to share, I am fully ready to just come up here and listen. But um, if if we'd like to talk afterwards as well, that that works, we, whatever. I'm aware to put you on the spot too much. Um, it's, so. it's okay. <laughs> If anyone has dealt with the, the loss of a parent and had anything to share, then then yeah, I think there's been a few people recently. So maybe so actually you don't have to be up here in front of the camera the whole time. We can let anyone else who's been through something recently or something uh, speak to it. John, was that you? John just lost a father. Axel, thank you. Yeah, so I, um, yeah, I know what you mean about, um, having, having the Dhamma, uh, having this practice to help with you know, the loss of a parent because I just lost my father back in November. And if I wasn't aware to kind of watch my mind through that whole process and see where it's going, or at least have, you know, uh, the reminders to do that on a pretty regular basis, then I would have allowed my mind to just keep going back into the unwholesome without really noticing or being, you know, without uh, being conscious of it. And so for me, it, it, it was amazing how, uh, how quickly I accepted my father's death and just kept having thoughts like, oh, this is, hundred percent normal. <laughs> and then it's really easy to let go at that point and just continue about your day. And I would have never imagined that that was possible, that level of acceptance and, you know, for something like that. Um, all my life, I just thought to myself, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, too much to bear once I lose a parent, but it wasn't, it was, it was fine. So, and yeah, um, I guess I, I wasn't extremely close to my father, but in some ways I was. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. I, that, that can figure into the equation as well. But there were plenty of ways that I did connect with my father. Um, so it, it just really helped to have, and of course, you know, the community here. <laughs> I mean, so many people really um, gave me a lot of encouragement through that time. And that is so helpful to have that. And so I, I thank you all <laughs> for for all the support, it's it's just been wonderful. So I, yeah, um, sticking with the practice, knowing that you always have a home, home being you know your happy place in meditation. That's well, what better home is there than that, you know? Um, and of course, the home of the sangha, the community, uh, home and well, refuge really is what I'm talking about. And the triple gym, 
you know, I mean, and I've noticed I can guide the mind just, well, I need to remind myself of this more often, but sometimes it can be a simple diversion, noticing the unwholesome and then just, you know, uh, reciting, uh, I don't know, refuge in the triple gem or triple gem <laughs> more specifically. Um, or chanting eighty piso, and then before you know it, you're just kind of back to normal instead of instead of going down a mental rabbit hole. So anyway, that's that's what I found very helpful through through that whole process, and and just yeah, nourishing mental states that are a little more wholesome, um, and things just kind of dissipate on their own. Um, it's amazing how much. You know, if you uh, where you place your focus most of the time, and how that can cause habits to arise, habits of thought. And I, I kind of realize a lot of grief and and things like that are just habits of thought. And habits are something I can control. So, uh, recognizing a lot of these things as mental formations, not as not taking them as reality necessarily. Uh, that's helped me a lot. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, um, I'd say you're going down the right path. Um, and to just hang in there, it'll, it'll be okay. Uh, so, thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I think we will let others um, come to Axel after, and we'll we'll bring back the question to to what people sharing about their lives in Dhamma. Although, if people want to share how Dhamma's helped them deal with grief, that is okay too. But perhaps those who haven't shared quite yet, please. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking a lot about my path kind of coming to the Dhamma and the Sangha. And I don't know, I mean, from a young age, I think it's a very human thing. Everyone kind of has this, this deep sense of who they are, at least I did. But I don't know, there's so much shame and so much fear that kind of gets in the way of that. And you feel like, oh, there's someone under there. And like, I want to try to, to find them. But there's so much on top. There's like all of this shame and all these expressions of shame. And so, I mean, naturally, I think as anyone does, um, sorry, <laughs> deep breaths. <laughs> you kind of just go through life and you try to find ways of just pulling that person that you feel like you should be out from the ether and discovering that. And so, I've gone through a lot of experimentation of different ways of kind of trying to pull that person out. Um, sorry, a little shaky. Um, and the main thing that like the first thing I kind of threw myself was into was kind of mathematics because I thought, oh, it's like this machinery for discovering truth, right? And you kind of go through, you do the, you do the proofs and whatnot. You try to find, um, you just find, find the answer, right? And then I went through that and I don't know, I kind of just ended up making myself more miserable, frankly. Um, you get obsessed with this kind of like, this like, who, like how smart people think you are and whatnot. Um, and yeah, um, and then I guess the next thing I kind of threw myself into was relationships. I don't know, there's like very um, prevalent kind of ideology in like Western culture, I feel especially like where you have like these two people at the beginning of the movie and then they're so miserable apart, but then they find each other and then they come together and then everything is okay. And I don't know, I guess I kind of went into like with that, into things with that naive perspective, but then I had a relationship with a very wonderful girl, um, but things just didn't work. Um, and after that experience, I was just like, sorry. You're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> I just asked myself, okay, like, I don't know. I can't, I, I go to all these external things 
and I try to find meaning in them. I try to find, rely on them to pull myself out of the ether and it just never works. And then I kind of just discovered I was left with myself, that there is no external condition that you need to, to pull yourself out of that ether. You just kind of have to be, and you have to have this compassion and this mental fortitude and to do that. And I've just discovered that when I follow the Dhamma and I interact with the Sangha, I feel, I don't want to say exactly like that person. I Sometimes I do, but I feel as close as I've ever been. I feel like I'm definitively on the path to being that person that I've always felt that existed somewhere deep down. So I guess that was my main journey and path. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I would also like to say I um, strongly agree with Axel. I think this is the most lovely community I've ever found in my life. Let's do three more sadhus for that. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Would you share your name for people? It doesn't have to be your full name, but it could uh, be if you wanted. Damien. Damien. Thank you, Damien. And just to say, Axel really dove in feet first to this community and uh, it's rare you see someone so young coming and just walked us with a lot of grace. And John has been a quiet bodhisattva in the background for so long. Uh, we had a bunch of whole bean coffee and we were preparing for the robe offering ceremony last year, which had about 150 people. And we found out that John was grinding all the coffee by hand, which uh, I don't know if one bicep is still larger than the other, but it was, he's going to be leaving soon and we'll, we'll miss him. I just want to encourage people to touch base with, with Axel after if they feel the need or Damien too. Oh. No, no, Matt, Matt, go for it. Well, but she's not. Who? Axel just went out the door. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll wait. I'll talk. Okay. I think someone on Zoom, top left, whoever you are. Oh, it's my mom. Is my mom? <laughs> hey, mom. I'm I'm really far away. Don't worry. <laughs> can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay. Um, I this was sort of for uh, Axel, um, but also um, I just finished leading a five week series for um, motherless daughters who lost their mothers, some by suicide some 20 years ago, some a year ago, some, and um, kind of the amazing thing from this writing, this um, writing workshop we did together was how one can transform one's relationship with the dead over time. And, um, you know, as John said, you can make it more wholesome, but it's worth exploring. And it's, a remarkable thing to be able to shape that relationship, even though their body has passed it from this life. It's, it's a remarkable gift. And um, I'm happy to send some uh, resources through um, Ajahn Nisabo. And um, I just want, I, I just want to say it's a very hopeful thing. It was very beautiful what people how people are shaping their relationships, even though their mothers are gone. And I'm in that boat as well, so to speak. I, um, you know, I lost my parents and my grandparents all at once. And um, it's something. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, mom. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I, I do recognize you. You're just far away. I promise. I know who you are. <laughs> I think we have another person that left who would like to share. Is that true? I don't know who it is, though. Joseph. Thank you. My Dhamma friends, I just wanted to start by offering you all the metta of this sun sticker. May you all be happy and well. Just wanted to share that warmth with you. I feel like I want to take this opportunity to thank some people who I'm deeply grateful for, for helping me on my Dharma path. Someone who's just coming to mind is 
the philosopher Alain de Baton, who has a YouTube channel called School of Life. It was his videos that helped me on the path to finding the Dharma, specifically uh, his videos on sublimation and the philosophy of Schopenhauer. And that was an essential part of the path that led to, in brief, Schopenhauer says that the way to deal with suffering is through either the path of the sage, or if you can't do that because it's too difficult, the path of art. So for many years, I tried to follow the path of art, and now I'm on a transition towards meditation. And um, I just wanted to thank, I had this brief, this thought just arose that if I didn't have an opportunity to thank him, uh, Alan is the owner of his actions, right? So just the fact that he acted in a skillful way that led people to the Dharma, he will experience the amazing benefits of that kindness. So even if I don't have a chance to thank the teachers in my life, all of them, I know that if I remember equanimity and the law of karma, then my heart will be happy and bright. So much of this path seems to be more and more the opening of Modena, you know, more rejoicing and generosity and the kindness of our teachers. Um, I just feel so grateful also for the, I want to give a shout out to the Jungian Society at uh, Toronto. So many, uh, for and, and Carl Jung for Kulaja Nisabo sometimes quotes, it's just in this day and age, there are people who still find mythological symbolism, you know, recollection of devas. Sometimes for me, the mind just rejoices in, in the language of symbolism and imagery. And it's just a way to translate inner states. And through Jung, I was able to have this kind of archetype of, it's almost like a yin and yang of, I called it Nix and Fanes, which is like this kind of god of light and this goddess of night. And I didn't really know what it meant. It was more of a feeling. And then I just learned from Ajahn Brahm, this talk, that in the Agamas, the translation for samadhi is stillness and knowing. And so there's this, again, this next piece of the puzzle, this transition from art into meditation that writes samadhi to honor our teacher Shakyamuni is to cultivate cultivate the noble eightfold path and to really understand what samadhi is. This idea of stillness, peace, and brightness, metta, knowing, this kindfulness. I feel just so inspired to share that. And all the people, oh, just. Because if I, we can't so thank kind. everyone. I'm sorry. What were you going to say, though? <laughs> it did, is, can you hear me? I, I can, I can, yes. Did I go over time? Not, maybe, maybe close, but I, I was just, uh, no, go on. What were you going to say? Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just, thank you. Sadhu, <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, modena. All right. Modena. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Joseph. And those stickers are delightful. Um, I was uh, reflecting on um, why I came to the Dharma and why I uh, started studying Buddhism. Um, and I remember it quite specifically, actually. Um, I remember uh, I was in my mid-20s, um, and I had a pretty rough time in my mid-20s trying to find work and trying to find out who I was, especially, and trying to define myself by, mostly by others, sort of with this idea of, like, if I kind of act like them and you know, behave like them and get a job like them, then I'll be able to find a community and kind of find happiness and stability through that. Um, but uh, sort of just after I was 25, maybe a year or two after, um, I had gone through um, treatment for uh, cancer. Um, and um, I was sitting at breakfast with my dad uh, in uh, New York. And we were talking kind of intensely about this, that, and the other. And I just 
you know, I had been struggling and trying to very unsure and very lost about who I was and who I wanted to be. And just said to him at breakfast, like, I just don't like who I am. I just really don't like who I am and who I, who I'm becoming. And, um, he had been practicing Buddhism for a very, very long time, but kind of grew up very Roman Catholic. And so was very, very careful about not pushing religion on anyone, um, including his kids. Uh, but he, that was sort of when he said, you should try to find some kind of spirituality, um, not even necessarily Buddhism. Um, but so through that, through him, I found um, Shambhala and started going to a Shambhala group and started kind of exploring this question of who I am and who I want to be. Um, and then sort of went deeper and deeper into it and eventually uh, started going to retreats and staying at monasteries and things like that. And always, there's always these days been a struggle between wanting to be who I really, really am while also living the teaching of the Buddha to let go of the self and sort of trying to understand what, what it means to be the person that I want to be while letting go of ego and while um, letting go of the self and having no self um, and sort of fig trying to understand what that means to me. Because on the one hand, I do want to like fly my own flag and be kind of known. Um, but on the other hand, there is this teaching of letting go of the self. Um, and I think what I've kind of been, what I've been trying to do in my practice now is to get deeper and deeper and deeper into what that means to try to find the kind of um, the Buddha within, as it as it were. Um, and I've been looking for a community, so it's really nice to know that a community like this exists in Seattle. I'm very grateful. Thank you. What's Sadhu? Sadhu. Uh, my name is uh, Liam. Thank you, Liam. Samak. It's about time. Hi, um, I want to thank Damien for sharing because I feel like my journey is very similar to his in a lot of ways. Um, I've been around Buddhism my whole life. Um, my parents, uh, my dad used to own a Nepalese goods shop and we sold a lot of like Vijayana, Neowari, Nepalese goods. So he knew like there'd be like hundreds of thangkas in his store and he would know the story for each of the thangkas. It's like, oh, this is the medicine Buddha and then this is his journey and blah, blah, blah. But as a kid, I never really paid attention to it. I was just like there <laughs> hanging out at his store, but not like taking in all the wisdom or anything of that nature. But it always felt like I was looking for something like there was like, I was trying to become something that I wasn't um, growing up and it always left me with a lot of anxiety and I would like dive headfirst into a lot of things to find, try to find that completeness, that like fulfillment of being. And it always felt like something was missing. Um, and I think I did that with a lot of things. I went like really hard into powerlifting, went to really hard into rock climbing, went into art as well. I did like drawing, but I always went like really hard and then I would like, accomplish a little bit and it would feel empty and I would drop it. Like I was like, I think it was drawing eight hours a day in high school. I did that for six months nonstop. And then I felt like I drew like this beautiful piece. I looked at it and I felt empty and I completely stopped drawing. <laughs> uh, and then uh, in COVID, like the first month of COVID, I like recently gone through a breakup and I was like very heartbroken and also like really, really depressed. And it was like the worst depression I've ever been through. And I 
didn't know like what to live for. It was like a really hard time. And during that time, I was also trying to trying to figure out like, why am I here? Like, if this problem will forever last, like why even exist? <laughs> it was kind of that. It was very existential. It was very like hard. And I read a book called uh, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. And it's not a great book, cause, <laughs> but that question really like stuck with me. And I journaled about it quite a bit. Like, what does it mean to take all actions such that I love myself like my life depends on it? And um, I started like creating a philosophy around that question and a way of life that was very much similar to the five precepts and very similar to the way of the Dhamma. Um, and tr I was reading a lot of stoicism at the same time. I started meditating because I didn't have enough mindfulness to journal at the end of the day and remember what I did throughout the day and started living a life that was really aligned with the Dhamma, but I didn't know <laughs> about the Dhamma at all. And this happened for like two, three years until I was 20, I think it was 20, when I was hanging out with Sam Vanderlind. I don't know if he's, he's not here today, but I was talking to him a bunch because we both started a job at the same time, and he had recently just came out of Goenka, a Goenka retreat. And I was like, oh, you figured something out. You seem happy and vibing. I feel like I figured something out, but we, we figured out different things. So the more we talked, the more I was like, I really am interested in this community that you're going to. And then I remember coming here for the first time and talking with Rick for maybe half an hour about values and honesty. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I think I found my community. This place is awesome. Uh, and I've been coming here ever since. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Sonek. I think we have time for one more, and it may be Angela. Is that Angela on the top left or someone else? Oh, JT, I'm sorry. I can't actually see the TV. No worries. JT, no worries. please. Um, well, I first thank you so much. Um, I only know about you all because of a service space doing meta meditation uh, about a month and a half ago. And I had this aha moment. So I've faced my own death at 12 years old. So I had the awakening very early on. I'm 46 now. And death has always been my catalyst. And my um, grandfather I was a Buddhist. Buddhism had always been around. Um, I never really follow anything. I just follow energy. And the Buddhist way has felt so right. Um, knowing that I could die at 12 really awakened my space and path and embracing death. And in the embracing of death is what's opened my life in a huge, huge way. Um, and uh, the biggest piece for me actually just happened a few, just about a month and a half ago when we, I was, I learned meta meditation, which I so resonated with joy because if you know death, you also know life. And I learned that from such an early age. And when I did the meta meditation, it was so powerful that it changed me. I couldn't sleep very well hormonal 46 year old and started doing meta meditation and it put me to sleep and joy has my nonprofit. We surround chronically and terminally ill children with a pile of puppies. Like we give joy healings. I sit with mothers whose children are dying and we see extreme joy. This is meta, right? I live meta, but I just today, just today was going, I just want to cry. I want to release because I know joy and I know death and I know life, but sometimes I feel like I just want to cry. And I came today and in your meditation, thank you so very much. I literally just cried, which is exactly what I needed because to know joy is also to know pain and to really express it. And because I hold space so much for people, I wanted a space where I could just let go. And the one thing I was feeling, I'm not attached to things or, or house when you were going through all of it. The only thing that made me cry so much was the attachment to my daughter. The idea if I die, my daughter, 
that's the attachment. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to cry. And Axel, um, when you spoke, I just want to let you know, um, when I was 30 years old, my dad took his life, um, suicide, and um, it was a powerful awakening. My grandfather and my grandmother died within five days, and it was all written in my journal before it happened. And so what I want to tell you, Axel, is um, losing a parent that you're not as attached to, in my experience, he was bipolar and an alcoholic, and I fucking loved to, oh, excuse me, whoop, sorry, drop the F-bomb there, um, but I still loved him. He showed me that people are complicated, and you can still be a good person, even if you have challenging life, and grief comes in so many forms. I would be at a stoplight, and I'd start crying out of nowhere. Or 10 years later, 15 years later, I saw myself crying, but I also met him in my dreams. And some of the most beautiful connection was after he died, when I could really connect to who his soul and spirit was. And there are levels of death. It's my experience. Those who you've deeply loved and they've supported you and those who, who are hard to love in real life. And there's so many levels of grief. So I just want to say welcome Welcome the grief, however it comes, and there is no judgment. There is no judgment. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I think that's a good place to wrap up. And JT, thank you so much. I remember seeing you at Service Spaces Zoom, and it's so great to see you join. And your words are very powerful. And if I'm ever sick, I would love a mountain of puppies. <laughs> That's an amazing practice. Um, but thank you for joining and introducing yourself to the community, really. Thank you. And um, just to acknowledge, you know, it, it's always interesting to open up space and see what comes. And it's a little bit messy. You don't know who's going to come up. Um, and it's always worth it, you know, to remember that the Buddha raised up the first noble truth of dukkha um, as the first in part because it's what we constantly turn for, from and berate ourselves about. And yet if we really hear the fact that people are, you know, there's so many people who are touching tragedy and there's comfort and compassion hidden in that fact that we all are kind of facing this together. And it really provides an urgency for developing this path, not just for ourselves, but for all those who suffer. The Tibetans have the recollection that all beings have been your mothers and daughters. And this idea of that connection of such love um, torn asunder or reconnected and healed, but just can we learn to channel that sort of love towards all those around us who need it and use moments like this of shared uh, sharing of sharing to just remember the urgency of that task and the honor of being given these teachings in this community to frame and direct it. So thank you all for, for all that. So on that note, let's read the blessing braid and you don't have a mic. So here. So People can also bring to mind those that they'd like to hold in this space and dedicate our practice to. But first, Milo can read, or Trenton. Um, for Parker, um, best darn cat companion ever, my heart and my boon companion, uh, requested by... Uh, Do we have any others uh, who we'd like to bring to mind um, and hold in our hearts today? Kristen. Matt recovering from stem cell transplant. But, mm, in the ICU, bypass surgery, neighbor, a nephew, nephew. Chat root. 
chat Ru, who passed away two days ago and has three daughters hold men Okay. Metta for him and his family. Marianne struggling with MS. Sunny, Axel's mother. What's her name? Leslie, Axel's grandmother. Mark, family member passed last Saturday. Met for a good transition. Michael and family going through a crisis. Cheryl, who passed February 1st. Alfred Manning for a positive rebirth. My sister, it's her birthday. Kruba Matt's father had a stroke in a forest dominant. Okay. And to all those who shared, we can chant the Buddha's words in loving kindness, page 37. 37. Now let us chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety. May all beings be at ease, Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, freed from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding, by not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. So for those who are feeling brave uh, or inspired and have been here three or less, feel free to raise your hand and just say your name and how you heard about us. No pressure. Alf, you first. Alf, good to see you. Oh, 
Welcome, Carmen. Welcome, Jonathan. Filippo, good to meet you. I can't see if anyone's raising their, ah, yes. Matt, welcome. Oh, Zoom, please. Who's that? Is, oh, Georgia. Oh, never mind. The volume's not turned on. Um, or maybe it is. Well, Georgia, it's good to meet you. If that was indeed you, <laughs> good, good. Welcome. All right, great. So um, uh, Bonnie long ago noticed that our sadhus sounded kind of somber. So now we make a special point of making them sparkly. Um, and uh, just so those who are new know, uh, Ajahn Kovilo translates sadhu as, yeah, yeah, that was awesome. And he's a Pali scholar, so I'm not going to question him. Um, but just let's three big sadhus for a community like this. It is rare. It is very rare. And it's just beautiful to see it form. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That was so, was that sparkly enough, Bonnie? Good. All right. So, um, so uh, monastics in my lineage don't touch money. Um, everything here is freely offered. Please uh, take books in the back. There's tons of them. They're just freely given. There's lots of food. If you don't help to eat them, people will be maybe not offended, but they'll have to find a way to get rid of it. So please go share food together. Um, and uh, just an encouragement to speak to uh, someone you haven't spoken to before, if you feel inspired to. Um, there's name tags in the back. Uh, if you shared during the YouTube and don't want to go up on, on YouTube, just talk to our AV crew so they can edit, edit you out. And for those on Zoom, feel free to stick around for a Zoom coffee hour. I think I got everything. Okay. Those who want to can bow to the Buddha, but no pressure. And we'll wave goodbye to the Zoom folks. All right. And uh, the potluck will go until about 11.45, and then we can clean up together.